How should we prepare for uh, the big events in the central bank's uh, action that awaits us over the next 24 hours? Well, there is nothing to prepare for when you know exactly what they are going to do and exactly what they are not going to do. And obviously, we know at this point that rates are not going higher and rates are not going lower at this meeting. And we certainly know that rates will be going lower at the meetings that are to come here between now and the end of the year. 50 basis points is what the futures market is pricing. And the only question is whether or not they do a quarter in September and a quarter in November or perhaps they do uh, 50 basis points at once in September, but we think they intend to get half of a percent out of the yield curve by the end of the year. That's still something to prepare for, David, in terms of the commentary, because every time the Fed speaks, the market listens, even if it may not be game-changing in a way. Uh, I think the market goes through the commentary with a fine-tooth comb. Yeah, and I would just make a distinction between traders and the market. And I accept what you're saying, that traders are a part of the market. But investors have gotten in a lot of trouble by allowing the traders to dictate uh, noise around what the Fed has done. The day of a Fed announcement, the day after a Fed announcement, you get a lot of the people trying to front run what the Fed is going to do or what they're going to say, what they're going to indicate going forward. And it adds to volatility. It's something like 14 of the last 16 Fed meetings, you've had a lot of activity within 24 hours, but then markets normalize. And I can't emphasize enough that we are sitting here right now with an S&P at double digits on the year. And we started the year with the market expecting six rate cuts that were going to begin in March. We're now not going to get our first rate cut till September, six months later, and we're only going to get maybe two rate cuts, and yet the markets have totally shrugged off all of the noise from before. So I don't think the Fed is the predominant actor right now, other than, to your point, the short-term volatility. You're expecting a cut in November, which, to my mind, is an outlier and makes you in the minority. Uh, Do you sense uh, that you're feeling a lot of questions asking you why would, why, why are you making that call right now? Because broader expectation is September or December. Well, my view is that it will be 50 basis points by the end of the year. And so the uh, mechanics of cutting in November versus September are not relevant to me. I don't have a view that it will be in November. I have a view that it will be half a point by the end of the year. Got it. And the futures market, surprisingly, has a double-digit percentage of odds that they will do half a point in September. I will be surprised if they do that. I expect it's more likely to be a quarter point in September and a quarter point later. But no, the timing between November and December is immaterial. Got it, got it. David, it's Sam here. Very good morning, good evening, your time. I mean, when you talk about uh, the market and expectations, uh, if they're sort of baked in and the markets are able to cut through arguably some of the other political noise that we're getting right now, um, why did stocks look so directionless to start the week? Um, I think that uh, stocks are right now dealing with uh, push-pull around the fact that the top-heavy parts of the market are deeply overvalued and that the fundamentals underneath a vast majority of the market are pretty good, that there is a, a healthy earnings environment. There has been no real clear sign so far into earnings season. We still have a long way to go. But for the bulk of the companies, Russell 2000, S&P 500, Earnings results, revenue results, forward guidance have been good. And yet there is a very heavy valuation, particularly for the top decile of big cap growth stocks. And so the markets are stuck in a little push pull there. And and when you've had the kind of move you've had, sometimes directionless is the best you can hope for. David, what's your assessment of the earnings so far? What are your expectations? What are these sort of reports likely to tell us about the AI tailwind, the macro headwind here? Well, I would be pretty agnostic about what this exact quarter is going to say for a particular company. But I think Google's results last week gave you a foreshadowing 
of what is to come, whether it's this quarter or another quarter around the AI story. And that is a sector that is clearly priced for perfection with overwhelming enthusiasm that is not rooted to a lot of clarity about what the revenue model will be. I, I think that there is at some point a reckoning coming in expectations that are far ahead of reality. That may be this quarter for some of these names. You had Google result uh, report last week, a pretty good quarter, and the stock got creamed. And that's what happens when these names get to these uber high valuations. So it's just not a space that we would be invested in. Um, it's very speculative at this time, and, and that's just simply because valuation is so far ahead of itself. So where would you be invested in then, David? Well, we would be invested where we are invested, which is always and forever in dividend-growing companies, uh, more high conviction, uh, more concentrated portfolio of higher quality names, of more of a value orientation. There are always other spots of the market that might be doing very well, but it's what we believe in as an area where you can protect yourself on the downside by having higher quality, avoid some of the value traps, avoid some of the speculation and euphoria that can get ahead of itself and focus on cash flow and the free cash flow that gets returned to shareholders via growing dividends. Okay, let's talk about some of your ideas, uh, David. Do you like American Electric Power, AEP, Gilead Sciences, as well as General Mills? Well, those are three good examples of names we own that we do like, and all for a very different reason. American Electric Power is making new highs. It's had an incredible year, over 20% gains, when utilities were uh, laggard last year. But American Electric Power is the only utility name we own. We own it because we think it is the best dividend grower in that sector and really entered the year very undervalued. Uh, it still remains a great dividend payer with all kinds of prospects for growth of dividend ahead. Gilead and General Mills represent a different story because they are more of the laggards or, or undervalued names that we think represent a great opportunity. General Mills in particular um, has been struggling to find that pricing power. They've been a huge investor into their own pet food business, and so they're waiting to achieve the returns on some of that. And uh, we think that patient investors are about to get very rewarded. And then the other name with Gilead is just simply a phenomenal name of dividend growth that has a great portfolio of drugs in HIV and now oncology. There's a sort of free call option in the weight loss space. They seem to be having very good results in some early testing in their weight loss drug, but it's impossible to price in what that future may look like. So you have a growth opportunity there, but in the meantime, a really good runway, a pipeline around HIV and oncology. Uh, I also want to get your thoughts in on the Russell 2000 and whether you're sifting through ideas because of the rate sensitivity in that segment. Well, I think it is true that the overall blended P.E. benefits when rates come down, that there is a significantly higher amount of names in the Russell 2000 that borrow money variable that have floating rate debt versus the S&P where the lion's share of companies are borrowing at fixed rate debt in the bond market. Therefore, lowering rates helps the Russell more than the S&P. I think that's true as a macro story. However, mm -hmm. the Russell 2000, with that many names of companies from $1 billion in valuation up to $5 billion, is filled with all kinds of dogs. There's some great stories in there and future mid-cap names, but there are about 40-something mm -hmm. percent of the names don't make any profit at all. So our mm -hmm. recommendation is... Small cap be uh, pursued only on a very active and selective basis.